Now we're starting. Thank you, Judah. It was awfully boring. Now we're starting. All right, yeah, okay, so tonight. Um, all right, enough. Now we're getting started. All right, so we're continuing our series in Philippians. And yeah, for those of you who are smart enough to read your notes and then look at my shirt, that's what I did today. I was writing my notes, and I said, dude, I need like a good opening illustration. Looked around my room. I thought for about 30 seconds. Couldn't find anything. I said, yo, wait. I'm wearing the Ratatouille shirt. So then I Googled synopsis of Ratatouille so I could remember the guy's name. Apparently it was Ego. Is that correct, Drew? I feel like you would know that kind of stuff. It's Ego. Is it? It feels like you were wrong. It feels, it's Ego. So it was Ego. And so honestly, I put that on there. But the more I thought about it, the more like every character was really, um, was really fitting the bill for me today. They all seem to fit the illustration. And, you know, it kind of goes to show we all are going to, we're all going to find ourselves in this, in this sermon today. So, all right, so Ratatouille. So I'm thinking back, remind you guys of the plot of Ratatouille. Ratatouille. Then the guy's name is not Ratatouille. The rat's name is Remy. The chef's name is Linguini. Okay, so rat, he is chilling in his country home, watching some old lady's TV, learn how to cook, reading books, becomes a great chef. Um, she sees him, shoots shotgun, he gets in the river, goes all the way to Paris. Next thing you know, he's in Chef Gusto's kitchen, you know? He's in there. He's up there. And so the next thing you know, he's in there cooking. Uh, your boy Linguini comes in. Linguini can't cook. He's the garbage boy, but he's actually Chef Gusto's son. Chef Gusto died. So then Linguini figures out, oh, if the rat controls me like a puppet, then we make good food. So then he's like, I got to save. Here, here we get into the illustration. The reputation of the restaurant, right? Chef Gusto had a five-star he was the youngest chef to get a five-star rating on his chef, I mean, in his, in his kitchen, in his restaurant. Then Ego comes. Ego knocks him down to four stars, says, bro, your cooking ain't that fire. Then he dies, and they take away a star when you die. So he was really a three-star restaurant. So a lot of this going on, not only does Remy want to be a good chef, but his favorite chef was Chef Cousteau. And he's trying to get the reputation, the reputation of the restaurant up. Okay, y'all holding on to that? Meanwhile... We got another reputation at Ego's reputation as a harsh critic. Ego goes around, and he's a harsh critic. He's got a reputation of being mean. You know, the guy with the long nose, long face, harsh critic. He's got a big reputation as, as the best critic in Paris and France. So Ego's reputation is at play. Also, Linguini's reputation because, come on, man, you got a rat controlling you. You that bad at cooking, you got a rat controlling you. Another reputation at play, Remy. Remy's father does not like humans. He's afraid of humans. Rats hate humans. Humans hate rats. So Remy's whole colony of rat family does not like that Remy is cooking and hanging out with humans. So a lot of reputations around. So that's where I wanted us to get going tonight, was thinking about reputations, right? Just like Remy is thinking about his reputation and his circumstances, he's thinking about you know, I, I want to keep my family safe because what I do is affecting them. You got ego. Because at the end of the movie, spoiler, ego gives a good review after figuring out it's the rat. When the rest of the world finds out it's a rat, ego loses his job. He's no longer a good critic. The, the whole restaurant has to be shut down and reopened as a new restaurant. So, reputations are at stake, right? Chef Cousteau reputation well, it doesn't really matter anymore, I guess. It's just carried on another way. Uh, Ego's reputation is now changed because now he, at the end of the movie, I don't know, he's like happy and like eating ratatouille all the time. But right, there's a reputation there at stake. So what we're going to talk about tonight is Paul and his circumstances and, like you guessed, his reputation, right? Because Paul, he is going to, you know, talk about his circumstances and he's going to talk about some people that are coming at him, right? They're coming at him hard. They're coming at his name. They're trying to, they're his rivals. They're, they're hoping to afflict him. Um, but also his circumstances are just really, really harsh, right? Um, and so that, that part doesn't play in too much to Ratatouille, but we're going to get there. So let's bow our eyes and close our heads. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read the scripture verse. And then 
Oh, you want to read Isaiah? Isaiah can read the scripture verse, and then we're going to jump in um, and look at what's going on in these verses, right? Because reminder, we're just going through Philippians. So we're just just walking through. There's no like long running theme. Like the book might have some general themes that we are going to point out, but it's not like we're like, hey, let me just find a verse on joy and talk about it. No, we're, we're just going through Philippians and we're, we're going to break it down. Get ready to read. Work on that cadence. Hurry up and look and see if there's any hard words that you don't know how to pronounce. Okay, good. Bow our eyes, close our heads. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, um, I thank you for these young guys and young gals um, in the room tonight, Lord. I thank you that you have given us a time and a place to meet, Lord, and to hear your word shared, God, and that um, your word holds up after all these years, Lord, to us and is applicable and is changing our lives and shaping us even today, God. Thank you that you gave us your word, God. I thank you that um, the word, Jesus, came and he put his reputation on the line, right? He did not count equality with you a thing to hold on to, but instead lowered himself, made himself like a human, God. And he lived the life that we could not live and died the death that we deserve, Lord, so that we can sit here tonight in right standing with you as sons and daughters of the king to talk about your word, God. So I thank you for that. I thank you for the work that your spirit's doing in our hearts right now. I thank you for the, the way that your spirit's at work in us, Lord, to complete the work that you started. So I ask, Lord, for your help tonight as we as we sit and listen to your word, as I attempt to explain your word, God, I ask for your help, for your spirit to move among us tonight. I ask all these things in your son's name, Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah, come up here. <clears throat> so do this for me. Read 12 through 18. Yes, sir. See, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord, wait, in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ wait, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in Pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and I that I rejoice. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. So, catching y'all up, right? Paul, he's writing a letter to the Philippians. He thanks God for the Philippians. He prays for the Philippians. And now he's, he's going to give the Philippians an update, right? He's going to... um. Update them on this present situation. I put present position just so we could have that alliteration there. Paul's present position. All those P's in a row, right? But Paul's going to give an update to his church in Philippi back home and say, hey, this is what's going on in Rome. That's what he's basically going to do. But um, he does it in such a way that we see his whole situation through this gospel lens. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight. That's going to come back at the very end as a key as a key piece here. But um, he doesn't really go into detail too, too much. But I want us to, to get a few things about his background here, about what's going on in Rome, so that we can understand this whole verse. So, verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me. So what has happened to him? Well, he was arrested. While he was arrested... He asks for an appeal to Caesar in Rome. So they, they put him on a boat to get to Rome. On the way there, his boat shipwrecks. Now he's afloat at sea. Then he lands somewhere, has to survive enough, still, and then has to still get 
to Rome just to be a prisoner. So he's been arrested. He's been shipwrecked. When he gets to Rome, he's on house arrest for two years. Um, and he's not just like on house arrest to be like, all right, like, you know, you, you, whatever. This is just a little punishment. You're on house arrest or, you know, you got to do community service. No, he's on house arrest awaiting a possible death sentence. So if this goes wrong for Paul, dead. He, he's getting the, he's getting, you know, I get, not the electric chair, but, you know, he's, he's, I don't know what he's getting, but he's, he's, he's going to die. Um, so just in case you're wondering, it's not what Paul had in mind. It's really not. Paul, this, the super apostle, I don't know if that's a real thing, but um, the apostle Paul, like the greatest missionary we know of, is like, I want to go to Rome and I want to preach the gospel. He's thinking amphitheaters, like crowds of people preaching sermons like he did in other cities, right? Um, or maybe that's what we're thinking. That's what we think it looks like to go be successful in Rome, the capital of the Roman um, Empire. Instead, He's there for two years, stuck inside, chained to a Roman guard. Chained to what he calls later um, the imperial guard. So that's verse 12. I'm going to skip around a little bit here, but we're going to get back to the whole thing. Verse 15 through 17 says, just to catch us up, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So, this is adding another piece to Paul's situation, right? We have his, you know, he's in house arrest. It's not going the way he, we might think it should go to go preach the gospel. Not only is on house arrest, chained to the Roman guard, but there's people in Rome You got one on one side preaching the gospel from goodwill, sincerely, um, out of love, um, doing it because they know what happened to Paul. And then people on this side are seeing it as an opportunity to get ahead, seeing it as, you know, Paul's my rival. When Paul's in jail and he can't preach, this means I get to make a bigger name for myself. Now, to be clear here, they are both, both groups of people are preaching the gospel. Elsewhere, Paul has no problem saying, that's false gospel. That's not true. That's wrong. This is the real gospel. He doesn't say that here. Both are preaching Christ, but one, their, their motivation, their heart posture behind it is, I want to get ahead. I want to get more followers than Paul. I want to make Paul feel bad in prison. Um, that's, you know, I want to afflict Paul in prison by, by getting ahead while he's stuck there. Uh, and then the other side is saying, Okay, that's my, that's my dude, Paul. I know what's going on. I love him. And out of goodwill and good motivation and love, they're preaching the gospel. So um, not only is Paul in a bad position, a bad situation, but he's got people on the outside slandering him, trying to, trying to get ahead, right? Trying to, trying to make him feel worse in prison. Um, I put that here, his rivals and his friends. The rivals, I said this side's rival, they preach from envy right? Jealousy, basically, and rivalry. They're full of ambition, trying to get themselves ahead, and they hope to afflict Paul. On this side, they, he has his friends, or, you know, I don't know if they were, like, best buds, but they have people other on the, on the other side who preach from goodwill. They preach from a heart of love. They preach um, with the understanding that, that Paul is right in the middle of God's plan, and he's there to defend the gospel, even where he's at. Um, and so I have here throughout you might see little bullet points with underlines how do you you know i put questions there these are questions for y'all that we'll probably come back to if we had small group on this but we don't so instead you can answer them on your own but i put there you know how do you deal with rivals right how do you deal with people who talk behind your back who gossip about you who are really maybe you're in a conversation and and they want to say something just to kind of put you down or maybe you're in a bad situation and, and they're taking advantage of you in that situation. You're already feeling worse. And it's like kicking you while you're already down. You got people like that. How do you deal with them? How do you think about them? And then two, um, I'm thinking here when I put friends question mark. Yeah, how do you, I mean, you can think about it and be thankful for the friends that are like Paul that understand Paul's position and understand that it's, he's right in the middle of God's plan. But I also want you to turn it in on yourself and think, how am I? 
as a friend, when my friend seems like he's in Paul's situation here, right? Who seems like um, they're in a tough spot. Am I a friend that sees that as an opportunity to get ahead a little bit, maybe move up in like, I don't know, popularity or like, um, you know, just maybe you don't even care. You just, you're too lazy. You just don't want to get mixed up. Um, or are you someone who, um, who loves your friend and, and can understand where they're at through a gospel lens of seeing their life through um, how is that affecting the kingdom? How is that, how is God's hand at work in your life? Are you a friend like that? Um, but I want us to stop right here for a second because I want, you know, this may feel very disconnected. You may be going, okay, Stephen's just going on and on about Paul's situation. You know, um, he's in prison, I guess, whatever. He's talking about these people who are kind of out there talking bad about Paul or they're still preaching the gospel, but they're, they're doing it in a way that, that the motivation is to hurt Paul. How does this affect me? <clears throat> I want to connect this back to us because at every, um, I, can, I can guarantee every single person here, whether it's now, whether it's already happened, whether it's in high school, whether it's in college, whether it's after you get your first job, whether it's after you get married, whether it's after you have a kid or after your kids grow up and then you're an empty nester and then, uh, you know, this is so far off. I can't even imagine this in my own head. But, but then maybe when you're a grandparent and then as you're about to die, like every stage of life, I think you can come to, come to this situation where you can empathize with Paul that you're in the place that you want to be in, but you're not there in the way that you thought you were going to be there doing the things you thought you were going to do, right? As someone who's just a little bit further along in that long journey I just described, I can definitely say that after I graduated high school, I was in the right position. I was in, you know, surrounded by people that were um, just like this. But also, I felt, you know, just like how I'm describing that Paul was in the, in, in the right place. But it just felt like this is not what I imagined. I can stand here and say that is something you're going to experience. In high school, you're going to graduate and you're going to go, this is not what I thought it was going to feel like. You're going to get to college you're going to go, this is not all that I thought it was going to be. You're going to graduate college and go, this is not all that I thought it would feel like after I graduated college. You're going to get your first job, and you're going to go, this is not what I felt like when I imagined having a job, or even getting the job that I really wanted. And you can, you can take that and, and go all the way through all the different really, really far away things I named for all those old people um, in the rest of the church. But I can guarantee you're going to come to that feeling, and you're going to, you're going to be in your Rome thinking, this is where I want to be. This is where I want to proclaim the gospel. This is where I, I want it to be. And you're going to be like, but this is not how I imagined it. And, and what do you do when you come to that situation? That's what I want us to pull from this verse, from these verses today. Paul has this amazing, and I put here, that's the title, this joy-giving perspective that I want us to try to glean tonight. Glean meaning like, I don't even know, but like, you know what I mean, kind of, no? Really, what I want you to take away, what I want you to take away tonight is this joy-giving perspective because None of us are the apostle. None of us are going to Rome. None of us probably, I can't say definitively, but none of us are going to probably be imprisoned for our beliefs. Um, but this perspective that we're going to see, Paul, just throughout this, these verses, this is, this is what I want us to take away from tonight. Okay. So keep that in mind as you're thinking through this, right? The way you're relating to this, this passage is probably that at some point you're going to be in your Rome. And you're going to be like, this, and I know, you know, you're just like, this is not what it felt like. This is, I'm in the wrong situation. And maybe there's even at the same time, people trying to put me down and I'm in conflict or people are trying to, trying to get ahead of me. Um, and so let's look at Paul's perspective and then we're going to look at his joy. Um, and then we'll wrap up. So back to verses um, 12 and 14. So I want you to know, brothers. That what has happened to me, here's the key, has really served to advance the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Okay, so... Paul views the situation in light of it advancing the gospel and how it's affecting other believers. 
So right from the jump, we see we just talked about what has happened. He's on house arrest. He's been shipwrecked. He's had a, a, a crazy journey to this point. What has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He's still in light of that, not, not thinking to himself, um, right? Like we can talk about um, this, this passage right here, this, this first quote. Um, instead of going on and on about his life in prison, Paul takes a different approach. He takes a divine perspective on the whole situation, right? That's what I'm seeing here. Paul's looking at his, his situation through the lens of the gospel. And he's saying, all these circumstances that to the rest of the world may look like, wow, that's tough. That's hard. Um, even to himself, that's not what I thought it would be. He sees it as it's advancing the gospel. He's keeping, that's his perspective. That's his angle on life. It's not this like rose-colored glasses. Oh, oh life's just, uh, it's all going to be okay. Like, um, I just look on the brighter side of everything. No, he's viewing it like that. But, but, but the key to that, though, is, it, is that he's seeing it in light of the gospel. Um, right? And in, 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 in verse 13, he, he expands that, right? He tells you how he's seen it advance the gospel. He's seen it advance the gospel because, in reality, his imprisonment, because he's letting people know, hey, this is for Christ, it's actually become known to the whole imperial guard. And to all the rest. Um, meaning these guys were Caesar's like secret service. The Imperial Guard are like Roman soldiers, but just kind of top of the line. They're handling these high profile um, criminals, if you want to call them that, prisoners. Because I know Paul's not a criminal. But, um, but they're like the elite guard. They're in Caesar's household. Um, I think some translations say that. Um, they might say the Imperial Guard and to all, or later, Sorry, later at the end of the, the chap, um, the end of the whole letter, Paul says, oh, and Caesar's, Caesar's household re- welcomes you. Um, so, so actually Paul's reaching people that probably wouldn't have been reached if he had just gone there and got up and started sharing the word on the streets, sharing it in front of crowds, preaching it. Um, someone said Paul was preaching his best sermons, not to hundreds and thousands of people, but to one person, one-on-one, like Imagine being shackled, me and Judah, just shackled together all day until Peter got off the night shift and he came and shackled himself to me and Judah went home and slept. Like, and then guess what? You're just stuck to me all day listening to me talk about Christ. That's what was happening. But then they would go back and they'd go back to Caesar's household to the, to the elite guard and they would say, oh, dude, you hear this guy, Paul? Like, the dude's like creepily joyful all the time and he keeps talking about this dude Jesus and then they all start talking and 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 some of them became believers and is now Christ is being known in Caesar's own household which probably wouldn't have happened if he just walked up and was like I'm in Rome let's go and just started going right um and so Paul's seeing that and he's saying like he's not just looking on the bright side but he's saying this is the gospel advancing in ways that that are amazing right like I just saw Haddon's face like like, yeah, that's the kind of way he's viewing his life, right? Are you viewing your life in that kind of way? Are you thinking about your circumstances in a way that's connected to the kingdom, that's connected to, to God's purposes, to God's glory, to, to Christ's work on the cross, right, to the gospel? Is that how you're viewing your situation? Or, or do you, you know, instead of going on and on about life in prison, are you just going on and on? I'm going to tell you, I have Often, later we're going to see Paul give the same kind of instruction. He's going to say, you know, stop complaining and grumbling. I am often the complainer and the grumbler. I will just go on and on. And it's so easy for me to go just sink into like self-pity. Like, man, are you kidding me? I got to do this. This is what I'm doing. Like, give me a break, right? Are you doing that? Or I'm being challenged. Are you seeing your life through the lens of the gospel? But hey, I'm actually getting to do this, and this is affecting this. And I see God's hand at work here, advancing his name, right? Um, let me finish reading that quote. I guess I stopped in the middle somewhere. Um, he takes the divine perspective on the whole situation, reminding the church that God's mission is being accomplished, that people are being positively impacted by his imprisonment, and that Christians are being emboldened. His words highlight how he treasures the gospel and thus maintains joy. Do you treasure the gospel enough to see your life, everything that you do, every, all of your situations, all of the things that happen, do you treasure the gospel enough to see it in light of the gospel? Okay. 
I think there was a second point here. It's affecting other believers, right? Verse 14. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So, and those little application questions. How are you viewing your, your circumstances? And then, do you know that your faith affects others, right? Paul's imprisonment and the way that he viewed it and the way that he talked about it affected other people. It emboldened them. It helped them to lose their fear. It helped them to become more courageous in talking about Christ. Um, you know, I can give a, an immediate application for this. On Saturday, when you guys come, Aaron talked about that, that time to share the word, to say, hey, we're going to go do our small groups. We're going to do um, some time of personal devotion, and then we're going to come back and share. That is a time where you can let what God's doing in you affect others positively, right? Here we see that, that Paul, in the way that he thought about his life, and the way that he talked about his life in light of the gospel, it, it emboldened other people. It made them more courageous and it helped them to not be fearful. You're going to have that opportunity. Are you going to let um, the way that Christ and God is at work in you affect other people positively? Or are you just going to keep talking about your life and what happens to you in a way that sounds like the world, that's just grumbling, that's just complaining, that doesn't give any glory to God, that doesn't ever talk about Jesus, right? Because that's the kind of options we have. We have either bringing God and Christ's glory in our lives, talking about what he's doing, what he's at work in, or it's all about us, right? And so we have this Saturday a great opportunity for you guys to say, do I know that my faith and what God's doing in my life affects other Christians and their faith? Um, and am I willing to step out courageously and do that, right? I think, and I've seen this at worship and prayer nights, when one person goes up, that's like a snowball effect, right? And that's the, that's the example. One person goes up, I think, in my mind, I think it was Val who went up first, and she shared. And then guess what? Little by little, people started coming up. People started coming up. And, and we were encouraged. We were encouraged by hearing what God was doing at, in, in other people's lives. And we thought about, we probably started thinking about, well, what is God doing in my life? What do I want to pray about? What do I want to share? And look, and that's how, that's how it happens. And so I want you guys to think about that for this week, for this Saturday. Okay, so that's Paul's perspective. But in verse um, 18, I think we add a piece here that I want us to talk about too. Because I said Paul's joy-giving perspective. It's not just Paul's perspective, right? Because I think I can do that too. I think I can give the right head answer. Like, yeah, um, this, this, and this are going wrong in my life. And it kind of is hurting me. And I don't like it. And it feels like suffering. But I know God's doing that. But my attitude can still be like, but I know God's at work. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, he's doing it. But, like, I still think, man, I wish I could be done. I just, this is not, this is not helpful. I can just live life in a way that, that can still have maybe the right perspective in my head. But I don't think it's bringing along the heart. And so Paul's joy-giving perspective, I want to talk about that joy for a second. Because verse um, 18 gives us a glimpse into why Paul's witness was so effective. Paul's witness was effective because he wasn't just saying the right things. He was living in a way that made people talk about it. That made people go, dude, what is this guy's in house arrest. And the what, like, what? He's joyful? That's going to be one of those themes I talk about probably throughout, Flip, I mean, throughout Philippians. Yeah, is this, this joy, this crazy joy that Paul has. Verse 18, what then? Right? We just talked about it. His, you know, all of his, all the things that are happening, the people that are slandering him, um, they're preaching the gospel both. And so what he says is, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense, meaning whether these guys who are doing it with the wrong motivation, or whether in truth, whether the people who are doing it from goodwill and love, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. And he's going to go on to say, um, yes, and I will rejoice. Um, and he goes on to keep talking. But what then? Okay, what now? What, what, what about it? I got people talking bad about me. I got people saying the gospel in a good way. These are, the, these are the things. I'm catching you guys up on Rome. This is what's going on in Rome. What then? Only that in every way Christ is proclaimed. And that's what he's rejoicing in. And in that I rejoice. So Paul's powerful joy is rooted. This, this joy, this perspective, it's rooted in Christ being proclaimed. Paul cares so much more about Christ's glory, about Christ 
name, about Christ's kingdom. He cares about that so much more than his own situation, than his own, uh, the own people who are slandering him, than his own reputation, that he's joyful. It, it's, it, it's that Jesus' name is getting made, um, getting, getting glorified, that that's what's giving him joy. His attitude, the way he lives his life, how he feels, it's rooted in Christ and Christ's reputation. And so, um, and so that's, I think, the key here. Because our heart, I think for our heart to really be joyful, to really um, rejoice in hard things and suffering and, and hard situations, it really has to be rooted in loving Christ's reputation more than ours. And, and loving Christ's gospel and, and caring about the advance of the gospel and not the advance of Paul, not the advance of Edward or Drew or Rachel, right? The advance of Christ. That's what our whole lives have to revolve around if we want to live a life that's joyful in hard times. So i got two more quotes here um, that I want to hit on. Does it bother you when others are praised, promoted, and more recognized than you? Right? What about if they try to tear you down in order to build themselves up? That's putting you both in the shoes of, of the person who's envious and who's rival us. Not a word. Right? And in the shoes of Paul, who's, who's having people afflict him, right? Who's having people talk bad about him. In both situations. Does it bother you? Are you envious, right? When others are praised, promoted, and recognized? Or, or how do you feel if they try to tear you down in order to build themselves up? Despite the fact that wrongly motivated preachers were using Paul's imprisonment as a means of tearing him down, Paul humbly said, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. The way you overcome your wicked jealousy... Or I would say the way you overcome your suffering or your the situation in life you find yourself in and how you feel, it's a the way you overcome that is by caring more for Jesus' glory than your own. Let the glory of Christ be your chief concern. All right, continuing. Every one of us should learn and take heart from this. No matter what hard place in which we may find ourselves, God can use us to advance his word in that very situation. Where is it that you feel restricted in life? I would say, where is it that, that you feel um, like people are afflicting you or, or that you feel like this is just not where I thought I would be, right? Wherever you find yourself, you can see your adverse situation as an opportunity to give testimony for Christ where one would otherwise not exist. You are not where you are by accident. You are where you are by divine appointment for the purpose of sharing the gospel. So, where do you find joy, and whose reputation do you care more about? Yours or Christ, right? Because um, if we're going to live like Paul and have this joy-giving perspective on everything, or if we're going to like, I, I keep saying lens because for me as someone who wears eyeglasses, these lens really affect everything I see. If I, don't, if I don't wear them, everything I see about life is blurry. It's all messed up. I probably would stub my toe a bunch, fall down the stairs, um, die in a car accident, like, because I just can't see. I'm really blind, right? So that's why I keep saying the lens, because to me, that's a really helpful illustration. But do you view everything in your life through the lens of the gospel, through the lens of, of, of Christ's reputation and of Christ's glory, right? Because if you do that, if you view your whole life through this, that's where that joy, that's where that that's that joy-giving perspective. It comes from the lens of the gospel. It comes from seeing everything as, okay, what's really happened to me? You know what? That served to advance the gospel, right? Um, and yeah, okay, people are talking bad about me. People are preaching Christ from bad motives. Some are preaching from good motives. I don't care. As long as Christ is proclaimed, that's why I rejoice. Um, and then be able to look back and say, and yeah, I see it. Um, the whole imperial guard and all the rest, they, they know the, that my imprisonment is for Christ. So I think that's the piece there, too. you got to share it. So I want you to go back this week. Ask these kind of questions to yourselves, right? Because I think these are good questions. How do you deal with your rivals? How, how good of a friend are you when your friends are in situations? You know, how do you view your circumstances? What lens do you view them through? Do you think about your circumstances critically? Do you know how your faith affects others? Um, and then where do you find joy? Whose reputation do you care more about, right? And I want us to just take away that 
And we want this joy-giving perspective. That joy-giving perspective is the gospel lens. It's, it's, it's Christ's glory, looking at our whole lives and saying, okay, on the whole landscape of my life, this feels like in the moment I'm in prison, I'm chained to a guard, and I can't do what I want to do. But how is God at work here? How is God's hand in my life? So I'm going to pray us out, and then I'm going to need help. There's three tables in the back. I just need these. There's 30 chairs, 10, 10 chairs at each table, boop, 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 because I had to move these three tables for us to be able to sit here tonight. So I'm looking at there's four ladies here, and the rest are guys. The rest are fellas. That's a lot. That's a lot of hands, and we can knock it out real quick. And look, I still hear Nick, and he's still going. So we got plenty of time. So let's bow our heads. Let's ask God to help us, right? We're going to need help. We're going to need God's spirit to move in us so that we can see ourselves, to get that perspective. We, we, we can't always do it on our own. We're going to need God's spirit, and we're going to need his word to help us as we look at our life and try to find this joy-giving perspective. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I thank you, Lord, that you use us, right? At the, ba- at the heart of this is that you are using us to advance your kingdom. And that is a privilege, Lord. The fact that, that you, you withheld um, your judgment on us and instead poured it out on your son, that is amazing grace that should motivate our lives to live for you, God. And to find that, that we're advancing your kingdom, that should help us find that as a privilege. So, Lord, I ask, Lord, that your spirit would move in our hearts um, and that we would feel that. We would, we would know your grace, God. I ask that as we read our Bibles and we worship and we pray, that you would help us, God, to get that perspective, to see that um, you are at work in our lives. And that everything is going for our good and for your glory. And that we are here, Lord, to bring you glory, God. And so I ask as we go out in this week, as maybe in the next couple of months or years, as we maybe run into a hard situation or suffering, or we get to that point where we go, this is just not what I thought. I ask that you would be there, God, to help us, to remind us, um, to give us that, that, that revelation that, hey, you're at work here, and this is what's going on, right? Um, and I ask that, Lord, in your son's name, Jesus' name, amen.